Hi, my name is Josh. Today we're going to be doing a mini EBM on end-stage liver disease. The goal of this talk is not to provide a comprehensive or rigorous review of the data, but more so to look at some of the seminal papers that help to define why we do what we do in the management of these patients. Let's take a look. The first paper we're going to look at is published in Gastroenterology in 1998, and they looked at cirrhotic patients with ascites who were undergoing large volume paracentesis and compared placebo to using albumin as a volume expander. They found that in the albumin group, there was decreased rates of renal insufficiency and hyponatremia, although they did not find any difference in survival between the two groups. A subsequent meta-analysis published in Hepatology in 2012, when they compared albumin not only to placebo, but to a number of other volume expanders, did show a mortality benefit with an odds ratio of 0.64. So these papers, among, uh, among others, have helped to define the role of albumin concurrent to large volume paracentesis. Next, let's take a look at this gastroenterology paper published in 1992. They looked at patients with cirrhosis who were coming in with upper GI bleeding, and then following their endoscopy, were either started on norfloxacin, 400 milligrams BID, or placebo. They found that infection rates in the norfloxacin group were 10% compared to placebo at 37%. This finding speaks directly to some of the pathophysiology of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, which made up a significant portion of these infections, which is due to gut translocation of bacteria, which these patients are at incredibly high risk for during GI bleeding. This study did not show any difference in mortality between the two groups. Interestingly, there was a, somewhat of a follow-up study in 2006, also published in Gastroenterology. Um, and in this study, they compared ceftriaxone antibiosis with one gram IV once daily compared to the norfloxacin dose discussed above. And they found that ceftriaxone was even better at preventing infection than norfloxacin. This is most likely due mostly to a change in bacteriology between the time the two studies were published, with more infections being due to gram-positive cocci and resistant gram-negative rods, which ceftriaxone is more effective at treating. In summary, these studies help to define the role of antibiotics um, in cirrhotic patients who are presenting with gastrointestinal bleeding. Next, we'll take a look at this New England Journal paper from 1999. This looked at patients who actually were diagnosed with acute spontaneous bacterial peritonitis and tried to compare whether treating them with antibiotics alone or antibiotics in combination with albumin was better. The antibiotic used was cefotaxime, and the albumin dose was 1.5 grams per kilogram at the time of diagnosis, followed by 1 gram per kilogram infusion on the third day of antibiotics. When comparing these two groups, um, the rate of non-reversible renal insufficiency was 10% compared to 33% in the non-albumin group. And when we looked at mortality, um, in-hospital mortality was 10% in the albumin group compared to 29 in the non-albumin group and three-month survival was 41% in the albumin group versus 22% in the non-albumin group. Most of this benefit came from HRS-associated mortality reduction, um, and the albumin itself played no role in the treatment of the infection itself. This study helped to define the use of albumin concurrent to antibiotics for the treatment of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Next, we'll look at this journal of clinical gastroenterology study from 2009, and they took a look at HRS type 1 and 2 patients and compared treatment with placebo versus octreotide, midodrine, and albumin. When they compared the two groups, they saw that transplant-free survival was better in the treatment group at 101 days compared to 18 days in the placebo group. In addition, when they looked at the one-month GFR in the treatment group, it was 48 compared to only 34 in the, uh, in the placebo group. So this study, among others, helped to define the treatment uh, of HRS type 1 and 2 with octreotide, midodrine, and albumin. Finally, we'll look at this New England Journal study from 2010, which was aimed at the, uh, the prevention of hepatic encephalopathy. They, compared, they were aiming to compare rifaximin with placebo, but actually in both arms, upwards of 90% of patients were on lactulose. So what it ended up being was a study comparing com combination treatment with rifaximin and lactulose versus lactulose alone. When they looked at a six-month period, um, first, in terms of breakthrough encephalopathy, in the combination group, it was only 22% compared to 46% in the lactulose-only group. In addition, um, these patients were hospitalized at a lower rate in the combination group 
14% versus 23% in the lactulose only group. And this was uh, hepatic encephalopathy associated hospitalization. So this paper, um, prior to this, rifaximin had been used mainly for the treatment of acute encephalopathy and not for prevention of, of hepatic encephalopathy. And following this, it's, it's now used mostly for prevention um, in combination with lactulose, as was described in the treatment group. So we can see this is a mini review of some of the papers that help define our management of end-stage liver disease and uh, can be used going forward in helping to manage these patients on a day-to-day -day basis. Thanks for watching.